First of all, I'll give you, I basically, I am the regional, my posh title as such, is I am the regional security director for Mercy Corps in the Middle East. Um, I started focusing on the Syria response, but then the joys of an organisation who we called the Islamic State, at that time started to spread, and then they went to Iraq. And then it started to affect countries like Lebanon and various things. So I became the Syria response security manager. And then it kind of bled from there into the rest of the region, into Libya, Gaza, and Yemen. And I've kind of spent the past, I've been with Mercy Corps for about two years and eight months, which in kind of constant emergency, um, emergency crisis like this, it feels like six months is a lifetime. It just seems this one just keeps coming in waves and it doesn't stop. And the thing is, you kind of see, when you look at other responses I've worked on, and I have a quick bit of my background is, I've worked in conflict zones off and on for 22 years now. Um, originally, different background, I was a photographer. Um, I worked in Bosnia and I used to work with various NGOs and various other people coming through. And then, you know, I kind of moved around the region and I started directly working for NGOs in um, 1998. That was the first time I actually directly worked for one. And that was in Kosovo. So a lot of my experience was in the Balkans. And you had very, very hard times when things were operationally difficult. But then what you would find is you could kind of chart the conflict and see where things are going and you know look for the ebb and flow and plan things but now covering the Middle East to compare it to then we seem to be in this kind of it's permanent crisis we are not actually dealing we're not we always have this conversation where you're going from emergency response through to development work and the reality is you seem to be as soon as your brain starts to settle and thinks an area's calm we can do this then the front lines change, the whole thing reverts back. And it's very, very, very problematic. And how to work in that environment and continually keep responding and changing the development and the nature of your programs and your response is quite difficult. Which kind of brings me to what I'm going to talk about tonight. So the plan is, for 20 minutes, I'll go off on a rant, you'll sit and listen and nod your head, and then afterwards we'll talk about it. And I think in the questions we can go into more depth you know, following up on these issues. So I'll set the scene and we'll take it from there, okay? So the title of my talk, I put up, basically, I mentioned 9-11. Not only is it, the, you know, the point when the date came, be I mean, the month came before the date, and it changed everything. The reality is that I see it as a kind of key point when looking at how we used to work as humanitarian organisations, how we built acceptance, how we protected ourselves, how we moved about. And then when you follow through from that initial point of the US going into Afghanistan and then through to 2003, the US invasion of Iraq, and all of a sudden the ground, we didn't realise at the time quite how much the game has changed. You went from being able to put in your experts, your expats, you know, your Western agency, let's use the term West on the perceptions of INGOs were big international organisations then. Now we're diversing into partnerships and smaller, you know, how you can be more effective. <coughs> but going back, they were much kind of bigger units. And yes, you had smaller organisations but when. But thinking back to 1993 in Bosnia, your protection was the white vehicle you were driving. The car was always white. You always had the branding on the side, do you know, it said the name of the agency, and you had a flag. You made the car, sometimes we'd put two or three flags on the cars. So when you were crossing the front lines, you had the lights on, you put the hazards on, and you just went for it. Now that's unthinkable, it's completely changed. It's a very, very different kind of method of operation. Do you know, obviously, the whole point of having your own convoys, I can actually recall being on agencies and responses and we'd have 112 of our own vehicles which would be white branded every one of them would have a big you know the Kodan aerial and you know 
everything. That was your protection being visibly obvious. You were a humanitarian and you were crossing these dangerous areas. The protection was you were coming in there, right? Now, for me, that changed. Um, there's an event. I, for my personal realisation that things have changed came in 2003 in Basra after the Americans had gone in. So, I recall... Um, I was at a meeting, I went over to another NGO, I was working for IMC at the time, and I'd driven myself, and I was in my white land cruiser, it's Iraq, I'm driving about Iraq in my white land cruiser, I've got a Kodan in the front, you know, a big aerial, it says IMC down the side, and uh, I drive myself home, and I've got the radio on, and I'm driving down this road, I'm on my own driving around Basra, because Basra was a holiday resort, early 2000, I mean kind of June to, well a holiday resort that was about 50, 6 degrees but fairly hot and I'm driving down this road and all of a sudden in the radio it cuts through, there's a message, it says there's a riot, I was heading down towards um, one of the main kind of army bases just to go and collect something and a message came through in the radio saying there was a riot and to turn around I, as I was on the road, I looked ahead and I could actually see them attacking. There was two cars, I was following two USAID vehicles, which were armoured vehicles, fortunately. And they started, came out, rushed them and started attacking them, right? And it was quite a scary experience for one of them, because basically they went up with a pistol. It was armoured glass, but they just sat pulling the trigger and looking at her while pulling the trigger, okay? Now, I was... Being young and foolish, I was a bit behind this, I saw it, I was in a four-wheel drive vehicle, so I just bumped over the central reservation and drove home. Got in, shut the barrier, and that was the last time one of the actual vehicles left. You know the whole point of having these big white vehicles? That was the last time that car, that car, I think it was years later, somebody stripped parts off it and things, it actually rotted in the office compound because it couldn't be moved out because it's such a symbol of something else. So, something changed. And bringing it forward and kind of, if you look at this, you had these points that you would find, for example, US Special Forces would run about in white land cruisers up in Kurdistan at the beginning, just as we started to um, started the attack to actually take, to actually invade Iraq. And again, I remember a protest, these pointless kind of conversations that people had and said, look, the white vehicle, that is our protection. We need that. And they were like, no, we just hired this car and it's white, it'll do us. And that was the response from then on this point. And you used to, there was no protection. I think a lot of us as humanitarians were slow to adjust to this new reality because you still had this thing, no, accept who we are, what we're here to do, we're here for your benefit, very kind of patronising, you know, very, you know, here we come, we're going to help you, no, don't throw rocks at us, you know, it's for your own benefit. And the reality is, we're, we're not completely different because the perception was of how you came, where you were doing, what your work you were there under the auspices because the US had invaded. Because you couldn't go to Iraq before, because Saddam didn't let you in. Now you were one of these new invaders running about. And we all wondered why it was so hard to get acceptance and get things working there and move forward. Therefore, that was an experience that stuck in my mind. And I worked lots of other places on the way, kind of going forward. But to me personally, I felt that was my moment when it changed and you changed here. <coughs> now, let's bring us forward to where we are now. And we have what, what, we, what we refer to as prescribed groups. And the reality of being a humanitarian and working. Obviously I've focused on Syria, but I've been working in Yemen quite a lot lately. I worked in Somalia before. And I've had brief experiences, you know, in private security work in, in Nigeria. You know, so you've got these organisations for your prescribed groups. And the problem is, if you want to work in an area where there is a pre prescribed group, therefore, 
there are more donor regulations. There are more kind of problems you have to overcome to do this. And how you work. And also the perception is, with Syria, you had very high profile, um, um, what do we call it, hostage situations, and we know how they ended, right? Some of them were humanitarians. And again, this is all leading into this change in what the operating environment is. And the problem is that there's this harsh reality if you want to work in these places. But for me, I started working inside Syria. I lived in Syria for seven months in the rebel controlled areas. And then there was this gradual, you had the emergence of Jabhat al-Nusra, which obviously was the Al-Qaeda affiliate. And then you had ISIS merged when they split. And ISIS were just these strange, crazy guys. Initially, we just looked at them as they're the hardcore ones who set up their own office and try and take over everything. But none of the locals like them, so they're not so much a problem. You just don't want to get caught by them. But, you know, don't worry about them too much. And then gradually, they started to take over more and more and more aspects of civil society. And they used to influence and change positions and get into the Sharia um, courts and things. And that enabled them to spread. And then all of a sudden, they're a direct threat to you. You cannot stay there. So, again, this idea of technical expertise. You're thinking, no, we're in here, we can stay here, we can work, we can bring in specific people. I can work directly with my own staff. And then I can build up their understanding, their awareness, and then I take it from there. You know, how things can work. If you're an engineer, if you're a wash expert, if you, you know, like some example from medical programs as well. But then all of a sudden you look at this and you say, we're going to have to move on. We can't do this. We cannot keep the expats in because the risk is too high. So then you go to the dreaded remote management. And the thing is, remote management is everything now. And again, that creates another culture shift. And that culture shift is one where you, I mean, it's not something I like, but the idea is people think of it as risk transfer. We all talk about partners all the time and using partners to implement our programs. And it's a great idea and we're building local capacity, but someone further up the chain is thinking, I've just transferred the risk and we're still working in Syria. And it hasn't. You know, it's this question of responsibility and how things come on. And there's so many different aspects to how this moves and how this kind of impacts and what you're trying to do and how you work. I mean, for me, there's several things. Let me just kind of make sure I haven't skipped any key bits because you're all looking very interested there. I mean, for me, what you have just now is we have this idea of a humanitarian system and how it's implemented. We're all functioning still upon UN principles. We still shout about the Geneva Convention. We still think all these things. But in reality, that original system, the UN agencies, how the UN agencies are met, how ICRC can keep their mandate, it's, the world's changed. We're applying old principles to a very, very new problem. All of the actors are much more aggressive. They're much more... We are dealing with Salafist, jihadist ideologies on many times. And it's harder. You cannot say to them, you know, can we work here? The perceptions are different. We are taking money from donors that is becoming more and more politicised, which is making it more difficult for us to operate inside, I would argue. And the more restrictions that the donors put upon us and what we can actually do, the harder your operations become. I think, from a personal perspective, I feel we have to focus upon old school values, the humanitarian imperative, right? To me, the humanitarian imperative is you want to work with the people who are most needy. Who are the most vulnerable, that is who you have to give aid to, right? It's not down to us 
or, or donors to decide if someone chooses to live inside an area that's controlled by ISIS, for example, or AQAP, you know, in southern Yemen, is it our right to judge them and say? There's a whole host of personal reasons why people stay. We are denying ourselves the right to work in sizable populations where there is a desperate need for humanitarian assistance. And I think, I would argue, that we have to push back on the donors who are putting greater, greater restrictions on it. The money has to be less limited. They have to be willing to take the risk to work in these high-risk areas. The world's changing. Everybody talks about duty of care, all of these words that have come in, but the reality is that if you look at people in ISIS areas, if you look at them closely, you look at families, the bulk of them are too poor to move. The bulk of them are not wanting to move because they don't want to end up. They've not got the money to sustain them in Turkey and rent a, rent a house or go to Lebanon or something. They're going to end up in a camp or something similar. If they leave your property, their house will be given over to some other IDPs. You could even you lose your land because you could be accused of you know, leaving, giving information to another side. There's a whole host of reasons why people come in. But I'd say as a humanitarian, and this is something that you need to think about, if someone is in there with their family, and if they have chosen to believe in that ideology, but they are starving, we still have to supply, we still have to work with these populations. It's not our job to judge. We are here to work, right? Take it back to basics. Look at the simplicity of what the task is and how it is. So there's whole areas that are not being serviced for this reason. Now, some agencies have managed to keep operations there. Um, I've personally overseen operations in ISIS and AQAP areas. And I've had to stop those operations because of a level of interference. And this is when I say, let's think about it. Let's go back to the original values. You can negotiate for access with an armed group. Let's not think of ISIS as ISIS. Let's not think of Jabhat al-Nusra as Jabhat al-Nusra. We need to know who they are. I would argue it's the same for the PYD in the Kurdish-controlled areas. They interfere heavily in your operations, but for a while they were media darlings. You know, the attractive girls with the guns, you know, brushing their hair on the BBC. The problem was but at the meantime, they were still trying to interfere and have things perceived that the aid is being delivered by them, you know, trying to manipulate these things. They're all armed actors. I think what you have to do with these armed actors is basically we created a protocol which we got other um, INGOs to sign off on. And the idea is that you can negotiate access but you don't overstep the mark. You don't start looking for protection from specific places, spe specific people. The whole thing is to keep this tied up and basically deal with the basics of you can legally negotiate access, but if they interfere, if your commodities are taken, if there's any diversion, then as an NGO, the most powerful f weapon we have is to withdraw your service. You can shout, you can sack someone, but it doesn't work. If you think your work is of any value and affects a community, that community will feel and create that pressure. It's the whole principle of acceptance that we talk about. And I think now that because a lot of people don't want to work in these areas, because you look at the regulations, weekly reporting, you know, from specific governments, you have to report weekly in these areas to prove that your stuff's not been interfered with. There's a kind of mass thing there that you have to do. And the thing is that it can be done. It should be done. Otherwise, we're not humanitarians. We're missing the point. <coughs> we're missing the point of working. The other thing is that when you look, for example, in Iraq, when you look at the areas that you have, for example, um, ISIS 
are much more accepted within, where they've managed to capture territory. These tend to be the Sunni areas, that Sunni band across the centre, you know, went to, to Crete, other places like that. There's a reason, there's enough ill feeling amongst these communities that they saw that as a level of except, you know, a level of defence against what now, when you look at the Shia militias, that are being let loose. And they're terrified of these. And for one reason, they look at it and they're like, well, what do I do? Do I live under ISIS and I'm fine? It's not very nice. Or do I do this? The problem is neutrality, impartiality, all the crap we spout we're meant to live by we're not doing that if we're not trying to work in these areas. And my argument is we would have to kind of push things to try and do that. The key thing for us as a humanitarian agency is to guarantee access. If you don't get access, you cannot work within these areas. These are key points of principles that we all have to kind of function on. And the thing is, to keep that access to the communities and keep our ability to keep functioning keep operating and supply them when they need it, you need those relationships. And I think that the countries of our donors can apply greater pressure to allow us to do this cross-line work, which would benefit a larger part of the um, communities. Organizations have their own rules and regulations regarding the security issues. For instance, um, if they have certain level of security, they have to um, withdraw from the country, mainly international staff, and leaving the, the, the national staff in order to carry out the, the work. So how can they, those organizations can be really uh, committed in order to follow up or continue their work and supporting those, those needy people in, 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 in affected areas? For instance, let, give, uh, can I give an example? Uh, in Yemen in 2014, there are around 50 or more than 50 refugees from Eritrea and Somalia, and they have been left without any support. Uh, even though they were having, uh, they were, they were, they were have been accepted as the as the asylum seekers in, or refugees in Yemen, but UNCR has abandoned them, and they left, all the staff has left, and they, those people were really in need for support, and they were suffering. So, how can you con convince those organisations in order to? Uh, commit to those people in that kind of situations? It's part of a more complex answer, I would argue. And it's something that has to change. Um, for example, the UN functions well in an established sovereign environment. You know, if for sides fighting an international war, the UN can negotiate its way across more effectively. When you're dealing with these smaller, more random actors, say, in Syria, they struggle. Not just because of the UN rules, but because of not just the security rules. For example, Syria is an example. I mean, effectively, the reason Mercy Corps are so big in northern Syria is because the UN couldn't work there. Because the UN couldn't do cross-border because it was technically illegal under international law. And this is another example, as conflicts kind of diversify and we've got these kind of more kind of hostile elements on the ground, NGOs can step into that vacuum that the classic system didn't. Again, the UN and Yemen, um, Yemen, there's mass problems for the UN agencies because politically the UN is not seen as impartial and many of the actors, particularly the Houthis, we don't allow them access to certain areas. Um, WFP in Syria, again, these large, the international organisations, um, they tend to have to work with a partner inside that's registered and associated with one side, one party in this war. And again, this is affecting the UN you know, operations in these countries like just now. And that's why I think we have to diversify the overall human global humanitarian system so that it's not so reliant on them UN, agen UN agencies when they're not going to be effective. When the conflict involves these multiple parties, um, they're not going to work unless you know, diplomacy is going to be brought to bear on these guys. Therefore, NGOs can step in and fill that void. And you can identify when this happens. And you know, the example is, you know, because the UN have scaled back. I was there when the UN evacuated from Yemen. 
and they completely pulled out. They went. They shouldn't have done. They should have left a small mission and then looked at re-establishing. That would have been a normal logical process. But the message sent by completely pulling out, and also it created a lot of very vulnerable communities, like you, as, as you say. So therefore, you know, it's, look, it's easy for me to stand here and bash the UN. You know, it's, it's fun. But the reality is, you know, they have a place. And I think we have to identify these times and places and how we can do that. Yeah, you briefly mentioned the WFP. In terms of the, there's the whole uh, the whole of Syria plan, um, and that's looking. You know, WFP a big actor on that. How do you get food to different places? Who can provide medical care and what's happening? I think there's a huge challenge though that the balance between on the left hand, some organisations will have registered offices within Damascus, mm -hmm. and on the right hand, what are they doing on their cross border work? And none of those hands can ever talk to each other. But also it creates this whole extra layers that you notice with the NGOs there and the UN bodies of how can you actually translate. So, you know, to realize that Mercy Corps are in the next village to where your NGO is working, how can you translate? And actually, with the whole sort of municipal structures, this old idea of wasters and the fact there that you can actually create more detriment, yet there doesn't really seem to be a sort of model for how people can relate and talk. And I don't know what you feel in your role, especially in security, of how can you better get NGOs to be able to open up? Because there's obvious reasons why they don't want to share, because there's the risk that we tell Mercy Corps something and something Terry goes wrong and it affects us because of the different structures they had to get to in that place. I mean, it's the classic way of working is we're all relying on the cluster system. And that's an example. And the UN heads a cluster system. So basically, with Syria, you have this overarching system which is meant to identify, assess and kind of flag up the key, you know, the key areas of need as such, you know, if you look at it in that sense. And the UN hold that. Now the reality is the NGOs fit into that system and respond as part of that. And a lot of them are WFP partners because, for example, WFP realises because of the limits of its registration in Damascus, how it works in the, you know, in the other controlled areas is a big, big problem for them. Therefore, they're reliant on the NGOs to provide this access. But at the same time, there's a lot of sensitive information that, in reality, if you're working in one of these areas, you're illegal, because Syria is still a sovereign country, and if you've crossed the border without a visa approved by Damascus, you're illegally in that country. Do you really want to start sharing, you know, with a centralized system in Damascus, that level of information? Straight away, I've got a problem with that, you know, because of a history of what's happened and these differences. Um, I think when I, when I talk about, it's not a case of bashing the UN. It's obvious there's certain conflicts. The UN system as it stands is not going to work. And I think that's when the donor should have sense, rather than flogging a dead horse and saying, right, money straight, we'll keep giving it to the UN agencies, say, this isn't going to be as impartially done as we need. Therefore, because of the nature of this conflict and how we identify it, we would like to put it this direction, you know, and funnel it out to the NGOs to have that. But with an oversight, agree a way that you can kind of get this information back, therefore it balances out. Um, what would have to change within the humanitarian community in order for us to actually go advocating to donors and to take up that role again? Because if it's not happening automatically, it should be according to our principles, but it's not. So. What has to change within us and within our community so that can happen? It's a difficult one because I'm a risk advisor and I'm not advocating saying, oh, you have to push, push, push and take greater risks. I think I would say there's safer ways to do this. You know, you can, but I think, I think as collectively as agencies, we've sat back and we've accepted greater regulation. We've accepted, you know, more humanitarian money going to contractors, for example. We've accepted that the military could carry out acceptance projects effectively, you know, in the key kind of conflicts we've been involved. And that came out of the development budgets. And I think we have to kind of 
we, we have to become a bit spiky, a bit, a bit more MSF, can I say? And I think it collectively as agencies and push rather than, you know, thinking if you have that collective message, it's more effective. Otherwise, one agency gets highlighted and gets seen as the more radical, you know, kind of, well, we're pushing it, don't go there. I think it has to be a very united front from the agencies. I think, I think a bit of apathy by the nature, particularly, look, you watch the news just now and watch the Middle East, it just waves and waves and waves and you think, well, where, what do I focus on? What can I achieve? What do I want here? And I think the reality is that I think we're, while trying to respond in this mess, the apathy is coming from us as well because our messages aren't clear. Thank you very much. That's really interesting.